I'm Alex Bogson. This week, the issue is protecting California's kids. With us, California first partner Jennifer Siebel Newsom talking about youth mental health. Also with us, David Ambrose, who survived years of abuse as a homeless kid and as a foster youth. Then we talked to Senator Alex Padilla about efforts to protect California workers in the heat. The issue is starts right now. Broadcasting across California, you're watching The Issue Is. In the absence of a United States national youth mental health strategy, California is breaking down barriers between health, education, and social services and building a comprehensive system that meets the needs of all Californians ages 0 to 26. California's first partner, Jennifer Siebel Newsom, recently traveled to the SNF Nostos Conference in Greece. Talk about California's approach to mental health and kids for a world stage. I'm Alex Michelson. Welcome to The Issue Is. Jennifer Siebel Newsom is back on our set for the very first time. Welcome back to The Issue Is. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, nice to have you in the house. Uh, so <laughs> let's talk about this very big issue of, of mental health, especially youth mental health. You started off your speech by telling in a very brave way, a very personal story about your own family. Um, can you share some of that with us and what you learned from it and how it shaped your worldview? Mm. Uh, so when I was almost seven, a few days before my seventh birthday, uh, we lost my older sister, Stacy in an accident. And I blamed myself for her death and didn't, you know, our family went to therapy maybe once. Back then, there were, you know, we didn't talk about mental health. We didn't talk about, there weren't all the programs and resources and support out there for families losing a child. Uh, and I struggled for years. Um, I tried to be perfect, tried to be two daughters instead of one, channeled my perfectionism into school and sports um, to, again, make up for the loss of my older sister, uh, but didn't understand the depths of the trauma that I had experienced, nor did my family. And uh, fortunately, now we're talking about trauma. We're talking about trauma-informed care. Uh, we are recognizing that a majority of the population have been traumatized. All of us experience some form of trauma as a result of the pandemic. And California is basically committed to revamping our entire youth behavioral uh, mental health system so that we can meet kids where they're at. We can address prevention, early intervention, and crisis management. Well, and let, let's talk about that. First, let's start with a stat, which is really very scary, and put mm. this up on the screen. Uh, it shows that one in three teen girls have seriously considered suicide. And so let's talk more about the investment she talked about. Here are some of the stats on that. A $4.7 billion investment, which includes 25,000 behavioral health professionals, training for teachers for early warning signs, and scholarships for mental health workers. You talked about that there isn't really a national strategy on this, that the world can learn from what California is doing. What do you want the world to learn from what California is doing? Well, first of all, I want to say uh, the Surgeon General of the United States is a rock star. We are yeah. so lucky to have Vivek Murphy. So he did, you know, clarify that youth mental health is the defining public health issue of our time. As a result of not having had a national mental health strategy for decades, state government is having to, you know, create and design their own youth mental health strategies. And so California... Um, is really committing to the fact that there can be no wrong door policy, that children need to receive the behavioral health services in school where they're at, regardless of their insurance policy. So it's a really dynamic, complex system with virtual hubs, with telehealth. Um, one of the programs that we committed to and invested so much in that's reaching children right now um, was designed by Child Mind Institute in partnership with government to basically provide coping skills, how to dig, deal with big emotions, um, breath work, all different mindfulness techniques in Spanish and English for not just students themselves, but administrators, teachers, and parents. So again, this is just like a holistic approach to redesigning a broken system. Well, and you talk about the Surgeon General. He, he talked about this warning when it comes to social media yes. and the way that it impacts teens. I know that's something you're especially yes. passionate about. What do you think can be done on the statewide level when it comes to that? So I think we need both statewide incentives, but really we need a national strategy to uh, address the, the damage and downside of 
the addictive technologies, um, social medias, as we know, is harming our teens. And um, I think parents were too trusting and naive. Um, you know, my my 13 year old was showing me some of these filters uh, that girls are are slowly coming to realize make them not like themselves and think mm. that they're not enough and think that they have to do something dramatic to to be enough, to be liked. Um, again, contributing to the 60% of teen girls experiencing sadness and hopelessness. And so it's, it's, it shouldn't be a surprise to us that there's a rise in, so, in suicidal ideation and suicide on the part of girls. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. And as a mother of two girls and two boys, this is not the world I want to raise my kids in. Uh, my children do not have iPhones. I see young children at restaurants, you know, um, at a park with a device. Parents think it's a babysitter, and so we have to do our part to educate parents of the dangers, but tech companies have to do their part. Do your kids have flip phones or? No, no they don't no. have any. Right they don't now. have any, really? One of my daughter has a watch. Okay. She does have an Apple Watch. To alert watch. you in an, an emergency or yes. something? Yes, and yeah. I, I, yes. Uh, let, let's touch a little bit more on, on you as a mom. How yes. do you deal with these issues with your kids? You mentioned that they don't have iPhones, but how do you talk about these issues with your kids? Yeah, I'm very honest, maybe too honest yeah. <laughs> with them. Sometimes I'm like, why did I just tell him that? Because Hunter's like, you know, you have anxiety. You, you know what I mean? Like, they don't, like some, sometimes it's too much for them. Um, uh, again, we all have mental health. You know, my family that I was born into, um, going back to my grandma, she had so much anxiety. She couldn't sit still. She was nervous and Nelly. There is good anxiety, right? And I think, so not all anxiety is bad. And I think really what we're trying to do is educate people and normalize people around mental health and how to turn what they have into a positive, how to manage it. Um, and again, we need that to live in today's day and age. Um, you know, this week, one of the big debates of the week was Barbenheimer. Do you pick yeah. Oppenheimer or do you pick Barbie? <laughs> right. So we know which one you picked. We've got a picture of you taking your family to the Barbie movie. Oh, there are all the kids. <laughs> what would you think and what did your kids think? Well, you know what? I did want to see Oppenheimer. I really yeah. did. Um, <laughs> um, but um, I, I didn't know if Oppenheimer was appropriate for them. Yeah. Um, the kids had a blast. Some of it went over their heads. But actually, I thought it was great. Uh, I thought I love Greta. I think she's an incredible... Uh, director, I'm so happy to see her there. I, I, I love the stars. I mean, they're fabulous uh, actors. It was really creative, nuanced, smart, feminist, uh, dynamic. You know, I think some men might, um, might, and young men in particular, might be like, what, what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's good for everyone. And I was proud of Mattel for. How'd your boys react to it? I think they were confused. <laughs> I'm not sure they were so impressed with Ken. Yeah. No, but great acting and fun and, you know, inspiring. And I can't wait to see Oppenheimer. Okay, I want to ask you about uh, one other thing. Uh, when the governor was on our show last year, he mentioned that you gave him the greatest gift. Here's what he said. My Father's Day gift, greatest gift ever. The best. I'm not even making this up. An outdoor pizza oven. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah. And I finally figured out I was buying frozen dough. No. Learn how to make your own dough. I'm the guy. It's a four hour <laughs> hellish experience where you should just physically. So you're see literally me. there making fresh pizzas it takes every me four Sunday. Hours. Yeah. So is that true? Is he really out there for four hours? Yes. No. He when he does something, he does it with complete um, attention and intention. I don't care how long it's going to take until he gets it done. He is one of those guys. <laughs> um, I'm always like, honey, it's a lot quicker and simpler if we just go buy the dough. Nope. I'm making my own dough. It's better. <laughs> um, he has a blast. No, it's fun. It's fun. It's, it's a good outlet for him. What's the best pizza he makes? Oh, I love when he puts arugula on top in the end. And a little of that truffle oil, it's really good. Oh, well, that's a, that sounds good. <laughs> okay. uh, this is a 30-second game to get to know your personal favorites. Okay. Last time we did this, we learned that The Brady Bunch was your favorite show. Okay. Uh, so now we're going to learn some more of your favorites. So here we go. Okay. We're going to start off with, what is your all-time favorite book? Ooh. Cast. Okay. What, who is your favorite sports team? Um, the Kings right now. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. Sacramento Kings. Sacramento Kings. Light the beam. Uh, who's your favorite athlete? I've always loved LeBron James. LeBron James. We're, we're praying for him and his family this week. Uh, favorite 
Republican. And Steph Curry, sorry. Yeah. Oh my God, all the Californians. Who's your favorite? And Darren Fox. Who's your favorite Republican? Oh, my dad. <laughs> there we go. And best thing about being a Californian? The weather, the geography, the people. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the governor told us last time your dad liked watching him on Hannity, right? My dad was proud of him. My yeah. mom was proud of him. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much you. for coming on. <laughs> Thanks for sharing this important thank you. message. I thank think you. it's really important we talk about mental health. Yes. And so we're grateful that you're leading that conversation. And we always like to end with music here. So we have, the last time you were on, you told us that your favorite artist is Sia. Mm. So we end with music from Sia. David Ambrose is next, but uh, you're watching The Issue Is. And this is your chance to rock out. Okay. <laughs> Unstoppable today. We go. All right. <laughs> this week, David Ambrose delivered a TEDx talk at Ridley Field in Chicago, discussing his remarkable story of overcoming childhood homelessness and foster care abuse. He writes about all of it in his memoir titled A Place Called Home, which is out now. David Ambrose, welcome to The Issue Is for the Thank very first very time. Much. Thank you very much. And congratulations on the book. I think it's really, really excellent and is something that everybody should read because it gives you a sense of an issue that we don't talk about enough, which is foster care. Yeah. We want to put up some stats on the screen of foster care. Foster care is the largest single source of homelessness after aging out of the system. Nearly 60% of young men will be convicted of a crime. More than half of America's homeless population spent time in foster care. Foster youth are more likely to die, end up in jail, be pregnant, or be sex trafficked than ever attend college. Here is a photo of a young David Ambrose. Can you tell us your story, the people that haven't read the book, of what you went through when it comes to homelessness and, and foster care? So I shared in my memoir the story of my family, which is truly the story of too many children. There's 8.4 million children that share something very similar. We started homeless. I was born into homelessness. There was not a before time. It was my normal. I had a brother, a sister, and my mom. My mom had a progressively worse mental health issue. And if there's an issue beyond poverty that I would like to focus on, it's mental health care because they're so intrinsically tied. We grew up for 12 years in the streets of New York City for the most part. We begged, we borrowed, we slept in the street until around 12, we entered foster care. And when I first entered foster care, I was convinced I was saved. And I learned very quickly that hell had a basement mm. and I was going to go into it for a period of time. I struggled through foster care, barely made it out with one good foster family out of all of them. And I ended up going to Vassar College and UCLA School of Law. You mentioned your education. Uh, we wanna put a picture up of your siblings as well because all of you are now thriving. Your mom, despite the mental illness, yeah. talked a lot about the importance of education and wanting you all to succeed. And all three of you now have advanced degrees. Your sister with a degree in social work. You mentioned yeah. your experience at Vassar, your law degree at UCLA. You have worked in local politics, including serving as the president of the LA City Planning Commission. There you are at City Hall. And you've had some pretty big corporate gigs as well for some of the biggest companies in the world. You're currently uh, serving as head of community engagement for Amazon. You previously worked, you see you there, uh, in terms of corporate responsibility for Walt Disney Television. And in the process of all of that, you've gotten to meet some of the biggest politicians in the world, like Hillary Clinton and Karen Bass, so many others. What has been your message to them about this issue of foster care? In our country, with 8.4 million children, not since 1999 has the phrase child poverty been uttered at a presidential debate. Mm. 8.4 million children. It's larger than the population of some states. And we ignore it. We flow around the issue as if it didn't exist. My message is consistently that economically it doesn't make sense. And morally, we can do better. This is not who we are. And when I speak to these individuals, folks like uh, Secretary Clinton or um, Mayor Bass, they are right there with us. But what's lacking is public interest in this issue. It seems overwhelming. And so we, we feel helpless to address it. And therefore, our elected people don't feel necessarily the motivation of the public to fix it. Because so often, the way things get done in politics, let's face it, 
is lobbyists, yeah. right? Corporations like Amazon or Disney or other big companies have people that go in and argue for certain policies and they give campaign donations and that's how things get done. But if you're in foster care, you barely have money to survive and eat. Yeah. You don't have money to go be a lobbyist in Sacramento or in Washington. And so a lot of these kids are often voiceless except for people like you. Uh, but we have made some progress in yeah. this state, including in a big way when it comes to college yeah. and foster care. We know Governor Newsom uh, believes in this issue. He had foster siblings growing yeah. up. Um, what is going on when it comes to college in California? Lots of good things. So California, just Governor Newsom just signed legislation that passed, which will provide free tuition, room and board for foster youth at Cal State, UC and the community colleges. It has been years of the making and we have some amazing legislators with lived experience as well as our governor and so law passed it's groundbreaking in the country and i think will have a huge impact in outcomes for kids like me coming through foster care uh, and, but another big issue is like where do they stay yeah. because we've talked about so many of the foster youth that end up homeless yeah. you're working on an initiative with this when it comes to getting a dorm for foster youth how's that work if a third of the homeless in LA County and, and the coastal counties are former foster youth. What is the master plan we have developed to address a third of the population? The answer is none. Well, what I propose is something different. What if we built a dorm at a number of community colleges across the state? We own the land. These are our children. You don't have to build parking and you can achieve scale. Mm -hmm. So there's so many pluses. And then also you emancipate young people to pursue a vocational two year or transfer we have a plethora of lawyers. We have a dearth of people in vocational trades. I think this helps on all fronts with the workforce crisis we have. So we could, we could do so many goods and also be, uh, live up to who we are as a people. So what's the answer? People saying yes? Seems like a no-brainer. Yeah, you know, everyone says yes. The challenge I find is uh, we need to do it. So a couple things are in motion. One, uh, very proud we are working to build a dorm in Los Angeles at one of the community colleges here, LA City College. Um, the idea would be to build it right on campus, right above the Red Line subway station, mm. so that people have access to this amazing institution. You know, it's, it's been interesting that you are now paying it forward through your experience. You've got a foster son. Yeah. Uh, we've got a picture of him as well, and I know you're so proud of him and his success and the lessons that you've taught him. I know you've learned a lot from yeah. him. Uh, you've also been on tour across the whole country, talking to a lot of churches about yeah. this issue, which is interesting, where you're also talking about your own experience as an openly gay man as yeah. well. What have you learned both from your son and from all these people you're meeting across the country when it comes to these issues? Uh, my foster son taught me my most important lesson, which is to be vulnerable. My foster son taught me that in order for him to live and process what he went through, that I had to share my experience. And before that, I hadn't really done that. And that vulnerability has helped me become a more full person, able to contribute with my memoir and share my story. Across the country, I've talked to conservative, liberal, all of it. My goal is to make sure that everyone knows that we have a stake in the lives of 8.4 million children. Mm. 700,000 foster children pass through the system each year. They're not red children, they're not blue children. They're America's children. And so I will talk and be in conversation with anyone that will listen. That's Saddleback Church up there on the screen. We should be talking to everybody about this issue because these are our children. Yeah, and the most vulnerable children that Absolutely. we have. And if you wanna solve homelessness, you gotta solve foster Absolutely. care. And if that's our biggest issue, we should be talking more about this. Yeah. We're so grateful for the work that you're doing. Uh, in this city of angels, you are uh, one of the angels of Thank this you. city. Um, and you know, we like to go to break with music on this show. So I asked you for your musical choice and you chose Undefeated by Rihanna J. Why that song? The lyrics itself speak to her struggle and the struggle of African-American females as they sought to uh, be recognized for their greatness. And it spoke to me so much as a young person coming up, despite everything you struggle against, being unseen and what it takes to achieve, in her phrase, to achieve gold. And so it has been so meaningful for me for years now. So it's my theme song. All right, so we go to break with that, your chance to rock out. More of the issue <laughs> is right after this. Say I'm too bold, I'm coming on strong. Say I'm too this, say I'm too that. Well, that's too bad, cause it ain't a secret. Oh, I will not sing. <laughs> I still believe it, I'm undefeated. I don't have to tell you that it is hot 
up and down California this weekend. But imagine how hot it is for farm workers. California's first Latino senator says new regulations are needed. With temperatures soaring, lawmakers are learning about a California farm worker named Asuncion Valdivia. He was only 53 years old when he died of heat stroke after picking grapes for 10 straight hours in 105 degree temperatures. Let's not let uh, Asuncion Valdivia's uh, death be in vain. California Senator Alex Padilla talking to us exclusively about his new legislation called the Asuncion Valdivia Heat Illness Injury and Fatality Prevention Act. That legislation would direct OSHA to regulate paid breaks in cooled spaces, access to water, limitations on heat exposure, and increased training and regulations on heat-related issues. What's the argument against this? Uh, a lot of pretexts, a lot of excuses about, you know, being bad for business. Nothing could be further from the truth. Last year, Padilla became the first U.S. senator to work alongside farm workers in the field. But this affects far more than just farm workers. There are an estimated 20,000 heat-related illnesses in California every year. Bottom line is workers deserve better. If Congress doesn't pass this, Senator Padilla hopes President Biden will enact reforms on his own. The time to act is now. A reminder to search for The Issue Is podcast wherever you stream for extended conversations every week. We'll be right back. Next week on The Issue Is, we catch up with future Hall of Fame pitcher Clayton Kershaw for a special edition focused on athletes using their platforms to help their communities. We'll also talk with Super Bowl champion and USC legend Juju Smith-Schuster. We end this week with an appreciation for America's Women's World Cup team. As we say goodbye, we also say, go Team USA. See you next week.